It is now my great pleasure to introduce another longtime supporter of community schools at both the state and national level levels, Congressman Steny Hoyer, who's the majority leader of the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, he's been a national champion uh, of community-based schools. Uh, Maryland is home uh, to several com uh, school community partnerships known as Judy Centers, named after Judy Hoyer, who was herself a tremendous leader uh, and advocate for early childhood education and community-based services before she passed away. Uh, Judy Centers combined early education and social services with specific Title I districts in Maryland. On a national level, Congressman Hoyer and Senator Ben Nelson introduced the Full Service Community Schools Act of 2009. The legislation would authorize $200 million per year for five years to fund federal grants, grants for partnerships between school districts and community-based organizations. So it's my pleasure to introduce a dear friend and a great leader, Steny Hoyer. Thank you very much, John. I am uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, and I am inclined to say that I adopt the remarks of the gentleman from uh, Great Britain uh, and from Chicago and sit down. You would be pleased, but you wouldn't expect me to do that. <laughs> I am very, very pleased to be here. Let me tell you a little story, if I can, at the beginning. First of all, weren't you pleased with the uh, uh, WAMU's uh, uh, reporter's accent? Wasn't that an impressive accent, Tony? Look, I want to tell you a little story. Uh, about a year after my wife died, uh, I got a call from the White House inviting me to a st state a dinner. And uh, they wanted to know who I was going to bring with me. So I called up, uh, my oldest daughter lives in Chicago, actually in, in Champaign, but they have a place in Chicago as well. And uh, so I called up my middle daughter, Stephanie. And I said to Stephanie, Stephanie, uh, the president's invited me to a state dinner. Uh, Prime Minister Blair and his wife are going to be the honorees. And uh, I'd like you to go. She said, what's wrong, Dad? You need a date? <laughs> I said, yes, I do. She said, oh, okay. And my middle daughter is not one for much glitz or this, and she's, I've been in politics all of her life, so it's really not too exciting uh, to her. Uh, but in any event, she agreed to go. So we went and, and with the cocktail party to begin with, and we spent a lot of time with Dick and Jane Gephardt and et cetera, et cetera. We went through the line, and uh, President Clinton, uh, so gracious, uh, gave me a, a, a real buildup in front of my daughter, and Stephanie was rolling her eyes and saying, you politicians all say that about one another. And so we went into the uh, East Room, and the couples were separated. Uh, they have husbands and wives or partners uh, or whatever sitting at different uh, tables. So you could tell Stephanie this was a real, uh, so other than she got a new dress for it that they had paid for. That was really neat. But she was real, this was not a great thing for her, and she was being very gracious to her dad, uh, who needed a company. So we walked over, and in the corner table, we got about two or three feet from the corner table, and she saw her name, Stephanie uh, Hoyer, and then she saw the name next to her. It was a knight of the realm uh, who sings songs from time to time. His name was Elton John. <laughs> from that time on, this dinner was a great success, Tony. <laughs> she was pleased that you were there, but Elton John really made her night. I want you to know. And I, when you said, talked about the knighthood, I thought to myself, there you are. Sir Elton John made uh, Stephanie's evening. Uh, I am uh, very pleased to, uh, to be here because of the subject as well. And I want to congratulate Prime Minister Blair, uh, who did so many great things, showed so much courage and character in the leadership of his country uh, at very, very difficult times. Uh, I am a huge fan. We had an opportunity to spend some time uh, in Ireland uh, as well with uh, President Clinton and uh, Prime Minister Blair. And uh, I think his leadership in so many different areas, uh, particularly as an ally of this country, whether you're for or against, uh, but uh, no, no ally has been stronger uh, than uh, the Blair-led government uh, of uh, Great Britain. So thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. I'm proud to join, uh, join you uh, in, and Secretary Duncan on this important day for the community schools movement. Movement. I'm using the word movement deliberately because what we are engaged in is nothing less than a project to reimagine what schools can be. 
uh, Arnie and uh, Prime Minister Blair spoke so eloquently about that. Sir Randy and I have discussed that as well. <laughs> I have confidence in our success because we're working in the long tradition of great educators and civic leaders who reimagined schools for their own times. There was a time, of course, when school buildings weren't expected to contain much beyond classrooms, chalkboards, and chairs. But more than a century ago, faced with the demands of urbanization, immigration, and universal education, the first community schools uh, reformers came to realize that schools can be and must be more than just places for instruction. Now, we wrote that, and as I read that, I thought to myself, no, that's not really correct. Traditional instruction. Because all that is done in a community school is instruction. It may not be categorized as instruction. It may not be traditional instruction. But it is, in fact, a learning experience uh, for children and for their families uh, as well. They can be the center and must be the center of their communities. Uh, Prime Minister, I don't know about your country, but I think it's probably the same. The only facility that is common to every community in America is a school and a firehouse. Now, the firehouses, for the most part, are not places where gathering goes on, uh, where you want to have an efficient uh, ability to egress quickly without people in the way. But schools are common to every community. They're accessible to every community. Uh, and unlike some other facilities in our communities, uh, who are, which are not so successful, housing offices are not very common in communities. Uh, Health care facilities, sometimes, but not always, common to a community. But a school is there. As the educator John Dewey put it in 1902, and I quote, The conception of the school as a social center is born of our entire democratic movement. That spirit gave us so many of the features of the educational landscape we take for granted today. Schools with auditoriums schools with playing fields, schools where neighbors come together to cheer at games, to participate in civic clubs, and even to vote. Uh, the secretary and the prime minister talked about that. Now, I'm sorry the uh, uh, secretary left uh, because uh, there was a time uh, during the course of the Clinton administration when there was a proposal uh, that Head Start's money uh, ought to be broadened in terms of its application so that capital expenses would be available from Head Start monies. I opposed that. And I said, that ought to be the last alternative. Uh, what really we ought to do is make sure that Head Starts and schools have collaborative efforts and uh, are co-located so that you can use the facilities, nutritional services, cafeterias, gymnasiums and auditoriums, janitorial services, all the services that one must pay for once one builds a capital facility but uh, need not be duplicated if you co-locate. Uh, it was interesting, and this is why Arnie Duncan is, I got uh, a call from my good and dear friend, Dick Durbin. And Dick said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean, Dick? He wasn't on the Labor Health Committee, on the Appropriations Committee, I was, he was on another subject. He said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean, what a minute? I just got a call from the Head Start people in Chicago, and they're very uptight with what you're doing. I said, well, why? And then Sid Yates called me, who was a wonderful, wonderful representative of Chicago. And he was not quite as animated <laughs> as Dick was, but uh, said the same message. What was the problem? The problem was that the Head Start people were concerned that they didn't have the keys to that facility, that it was owned by somebody else, run by the principal. It was a turf issue. Judy, uh, who I'll talk about in a second, you've already heard John Potesta talk about, uh, was concerned about turf battles. When Hillary Clinton wrote that it takes a village, a community uh, school is the village, and indeed ought to be the village. Because, as Prime Minister Blair pointed out and Secretary Duncan pointed out, we make a tremendous capital investment in a school. And because we talk, call it a school, we have somehow intellectually limited its scope because of our traditional understanding of what a school is. If we call it a community school, if nothing else, that will broaden our understanding. Uh, our work is a revival of the tradition of community schools of which John Dewey spoke. It's not a movement simply because its ambitions are large, but because it's being driven from the ground up 
by teachers, by innovative administrators, by partners in the private sector. I'm proud to say that one of those reformers was my late wife, Judy, as John pointed out. Uh, there are now 24 Judith P. Hoyer Early Childhood Education and Child Care Centers in Maryland. The only reason there are not more, Tony, is because of resources. Because every place I go, somebody either knows somebody who's in a uh, center, they have a child in a center, they teach in a center, they're a parent involved in a center, they're a health care person, they're a social service uh, person, uh, they're an adult uh, uh, literacy uh, uh, educator, and they all tell me how wonderful these schools are and we need to have more. Uh, I'm hopeful that as soon as this economic uh, uh, downturn or we get that $200 million authorization passed, uh, that we will have additional sums for these uh, schools. Teachers like Judy see the need for change firsthand every day. Randy Weingarten knows that because she talks to her teachers. Others of you who are teachers or uh, work w with respect to teachers know that. Every day they work hard to reach students whose struggles begin before they set foot in the classroom. They are students missing out on three square meals a day. Arnie said feed them. Makes sense. Or regular doctor visits or even safety on the way back home from school. You talked about the communities and Arnie talked about uh, the Harlem uh, safe neighborhoods uh, effort. While our teachers understand that there can be no excuses in education, they also know that even the most sheltering schools, the most dedicated instructors, and the most motivated students can't erase the effects of those challenges without help. Those who criticize Hillary Clinton for it takes a village and said, oh, it's no, just parents. I don't think we're ever parents. Because if I'm a parent, I have three daughters, I have three grandchildren, and one great-granddaughter. And I know that my granddaughter, uh, who has my great-granddaughter, she needs help. She cannot do it alone. She needs a child care provider. She needs babysitters. Uh, luckily, she's got uh, uh, parents uh, that can do that. Uh, but she needs help. She cannot do it alone. And to the extent she gets help, Ava, my great-granddaughter, is advantaged. So community schools are designed to remove roadblocks to academic success. They work with local organizations and the private sector to coordinate a wide range of services. That's the key. Because they need a wide range of services. And it is not just the students who need services. It's their parents, their parent, or parents as well. At a full-service community school, you might end up, uh, might find health clinics or dental care, mental health counseling, English lessons for parents, adult courses, nutrition education, or career advice, or a myriad of other services that will enhance the experience and the welfare of the child and the child's family. But there are few places more welcoming to house them than the neighborhood school. For the reasons I've mentioned, I'm sure I got here halfway through, but I know, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you talked about that, and I know Secretary Duncan talked about it. Schools like these stay open long after school hours on weekends, too. Uh, Secretary Duncan must have mentioned that ten times while I was sitting here in the short period of time I heard him speak. Why? An extraordinary investment. In my uh, area of the state of Maryland, uh, we spend 80 to $100 million to build a high school. And equipping it costs more. How short-sighted and tax-insensitive it is to limit the use of that facility uh, to a single use. There are places for neighbors to learn together, work together, and crucially, places for parents to participate in their children's education. Schools like these quickly become the hearts of their communities. And the reason that community schools now have such strong political support is that these results don't just happen in theory. They have happened again and again when parents, teachers, administrators, communities, and the private sector have worked to put the community schools model in place. Uh, with uh, extraordinary success, as we saw in Great Britain under uh, Prime Minister Blair's leadership, and as we saw in Chicago, as we're seeing under Martin O'Malley, uh, and Paris Glendening was the one, frankly, who got, uh, was a partner with me and with Mark Shriver of the Shriver family. Mark introduced the bill in the House. Uh, in Arlington, Virginia, Carlin Springs Elementary School serves many low-income and immigrant families. As a community school, it's begun working closely with 29 partner organizations. Think for a second, if you asked a parent, 
with limited resources and probably limited uh, opportunity for transportation, independent transportation, to access the services that those 29 organizations provide. Think if you ask that parent, go here, go there, go the other place, as opposed to saying we have centralized these services at the community school where you take your child. How more efficient and effective those services would be. It's begun working closely with 29 partner organizations and more than 80 parent and neighborhood volunteers. In one innovative program, students run a school-based branch of a local credit union, learning about budgets, savings, and basic economics. Do you do that? I saw somebody smiling there as if you were the ones, but if you are, congratulations. Parents can take advantage of workshops, summer family programs, family library nights, and much more. In one innovative program, Second through fifth grade students run a school-based branch of a local credit union. I already said that. Got two pages the same. It off <laughs> the good news is I realized it. <laughs> Think how bad it would have been if I hadn't realized it. <laughs> Just push that button and Hoyer speaks, right? It offers a full-service school-based health center with medical and mental health clinics, after-school and summer programs that include athletics, Performing and visual arts, technology, design, and leadership training, English language, computer, GED, and vocational classes for parents in the community. Think how efficient that is in having available those services in the community school. Uh, there, too, parents' involvement in their children's education is on the rise, which you mentioned, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, and so is student achievement. We have seen results like that across America. And as Prime Minister Blair pointed out, across the Atlantic as well. A decade of research, full-service community schools, has consistently shown that they promote higher student achievement and literacy, stronger discipline, better attendance and parental participation, a reduction in dropouts and an increased access to preventive health care. Let me say as an aside, I was so pleased to hear Prime Minister Blair say that when the teacher uh, had a problem, that the community ought to step in and support the teacher. Unfortunately, that happens less in America than it did 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 60 years ago. We need to reinvigorate in parents the understanding that teachers are there to help their child. They are not the adversary. Uh, they are the ally. Uh, I'd point out that the last factor is especially important in light of a possible uh, flu ec epidemic. That was the preventive health care that I did the insert. Politicians cannot claim to have started the community schools movement, of course, but we have paid attention to the results and many of us are thoroughly convinced. That's why President Obama and Secretary Duncan are strong supporters of community schools. That's why every public school in England will provide extended services by 2010. Thank you, Tony Blair. That's why I introduced... And if all the children and parents were here from Great Britain, they would be standing and applauding, Mr. Prime Minister. That's why, as uh, John Podesta indicated, I introduced legislation that will make a strong commitment to community schools here in the United States. Now, I've been at this effort for uh, over a decade and a half as a member of the Labor Health Committee. We have not made as quick a progress as we should have. My expectation is that under President Obama's leadership and Secretary Duncan's leadership and with uh, our strong advocacy, we will make much better progress. That legislation would mean grants for states and school districts to work with community organizations and businesses to create the kind of programs that have had success at schools like Carlin Springs and Mirable Sisters. This is not a compunction, um, but a uh, help. This is not forcing people to do things. This is giving them uh, incentives to do things, which is the more positive uh, way to approach it. It would greatly expand the number of full-service community schools in America. It's a bill, I believe, uh, in both as a congressman committed to education and one committed to fiscal responsibility. Uh, you recall, perhaps, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, there was a governor in our state elected in 1966, on the same year I was elected to the Maryland State Senate. He was elected as a progressive governor in our state. He gave an inaugural address in January of 1967 in which he gave a very profound uh, uh, sentence. Others of it, other parts of the speech were pretty good, too. He said that the cost of failure 
far exceeds the price of progress. I want you to think about that. Investing in community schools will be far cheaper than investing in the failure of our students, the imprisoning of some of our people, uh, the lack of uh, ability to work, uh, the failure to produce taxpayers as opposed to tax takers, uh, the cost of failure. That governor was Spiro T. Agnew, who later became vice president of the United States and somewhat changed his politics, as you may know. <laughs> Stronger services in schools are clearly an investment up front. But if they keep a child from delinquency or help a child get vaccinated, they can save us the much higher costs of which I've spoken. For me, the movement is both an obligation and an opportunity. It's an obligation because the inequality that still cripples our schools and our students' future is an affront to the promise of public education. And it's an opportunity because just like John Dewey's generation of reformers, we can create new ways of thinking about schools that the parents and students to come may one day take for granted. We have the chance to reimagine our schools, and I hope uh, that all of us will commit ourselves to that end. Thank you very much uh, to all of you and to CAP for the work that you're doing and the great leadership of our leader, John Podesta. Thank you all very much.